I'm very happy to introduce uh, Dr. Henry Kuhn. He's an assistant professor of medicine with Case Western Reserve University in the Division of Hematology Oncology. Dr. Kuhn did his residency in medicine at University Hospitals at Jackson, Mississippi, and his hematology oncology fellowship at Harvard's Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital in Boston. He's an author and co-author on many papers and book chapters with an emphasis on immune regulation to fight cancer, and is an avid clinical researcher. He's a kind, genuine, thoughtful person, and I'm really happy he could take the time to speak today with us. Uh, the title of his talk is Later Stage Melanoma uh, Treatment at University Hospital, Case Western Reserve University, and Institutional Clinical Trials, including ECOG trials. And please give Dr. Kuhn a round of applause. to clarify what the button was that would make the screen go blank. Uh, so I appreciate uh, Bruce and Valerie putting this uh, session together. Uh, being relatively new to Cleveland, I keep saying that, I've only been here for about three years, I, I think you guys are blessed to have three institutions that have pretty strong melanoma programs with, with Metro Cleveland Clinic and UH, so you've got a lot of treatment options in the area, and we appreciate you guys coming out on a Saturday morning to hear us talk. Um, I'm going to focus on current therapy for melanoma. This is a slide that I borrowed from my mentor, which he used to show for five or six years when I was a fellow, and I kept thinking, like, Mike, when are you going to update your slide? Uh, you know, and, and our problem has been is that new therapies for melanoma have been slow to come, but I think that that's all changing quite rapidly. Uh, there's a number of new agents that are out. Uh, we're going to talk about one that was the first drug that was uh, showed a survival benefit in a randomized phase three trial. Uh, there are a number of other interesting agents that look like they're moving quite quickly through clinical development. Um, the way I like to think about melanoma therapy is things that target the tumor and things that try and get the host to target the tumor. Uh, so classically what people think about when they talk about things that target the tumor or chemotherapies. When you look at chemotherapies, and the thing to kind of focus on here is this last column, um, response rates are reasonably low, and the majority of patients after three to four months progress on and need some other new therapy. So a number of uh, methods have been tried to improve the rate the rates of uh, response to chemotherapy and also to improve the durability of response. Uh, one thing that our institution's been studying is potentially using uh, s drugs that block DNA repair. <coughs> so most chemotherapies, or the chemotherapies we use for melanoma, uh, work by damaging D uh, DNA. So decarbazine and temozolomide both cause uh, what are called addicts or or methylation in uh, DNA, particularly we hope in tumors as opposed to normal DNA. And what can happen is if the cancer cell uh, cannot repair them, you have, you have cell death, but, uh, but if they can repair, then you see cancer cell survival. So methoxamine is a small molecule inhibitor of base excision repair. Uh, methoxamine blocks DNA repair and we hope that this will lead to cancer cell death as opposed to cancer cell survival. We've looked in cell lines and seen that when you look on, on this axis, you'll see this represents number of cells surviving when exposed to chemotherapy, that, when you, that there's always a percentage of cells that remain after we've treated with even increasing doses of chemotherapy. But when you add methoxamine, you get to the point where you can eliminate all the cells. Currently, we've got an ongoing phase one study uh, trying to determine what the toxicity of this combination is using temozolomide uh, and methoxamine. Temozolomide is, uh, has already been mentioned as a cousin to DTSE that's used quite frequently in melanoma. 
for this trial, we actually allow patients with brain mets uh, because, they're, because both drugs penetrate the brain. So we've got two cohorts, one for patients without brain metastasis, one for patients with. Um, and both the speakers before me have, have briefly mentioned signal transduction inhibitors. Uh, signal transduction inhibitors, this is a little bit of a busy slide, but it's worth knowing. When we talk about signal transduction inhibitors, these are things that block either receptors or enzymes that are in uh, melanoma cells. These are all proteins, or, or I like to think of them as switches, that the body normally uses that cancer somehow has subterfuged and made it where instead of having the cell perform its normal function, it actually now assumes a malignant phenotype. And what we found is that in a number of normal genes, we see mutations, uh, particularly in CK, it's been mentioned, there are a couple of other receptors that have, that have been identified, BRAF uh, and also another gene called RAS. So these genes uh, potentially are all targets for drug, uh, and a number of drugs that target these are in clinical trials. As, uh, and the other thing that uh, Ed had mentioned was, was uh, we have now know, know that these mutations or these aberrations in normal signaling uh, occur in kind of specific groupings. Where before, when we used to describe melanoma, when we could only look at it through the microscope, the pathologist would talk to us about what the cells look like. Did they look more like they were a nevus, which would be called nevoid melanoma? Did they look like they spread superficially along the skin? But what we've come to realize over the past uh, few years with some breakthroughs in, in molecular biology is that you can actually group melanomas by what their genetic defects are. And when you start to look at these, melanomas break down into melanomas that don't have chronic sun-damaged skin, which is the CSD, do have chronic sun-damaged skin, uh, acral, which are melanomas that occur on the hands, feet, nails, fingernails, and mucosal, which you have heard mentioned briefly, which are melanomas that occur on mucosal surfaces, like in the mouth, uh, vagina, or rectum. Uh, and when you look, these mutations, the one in non-sun non damaged skins, have a prevalence of BRAF mutations. But when you look at chronic sun damaged skin, acral, which are the hands and feet again, mucosal, you see this prevalence of CKIT either mutations or amplifications. And so this has actually led to the observation that BRAF mutations are rare in this population. Uh, and uh, and because of this, people have tried imatinib, which is Gleevec, which is a, an inhibitor of the CKIT enzyme. Uh, a number of trials have been conducted, and when you look overall, the, res the number of people who actually carry what we call the mutation, which is like where the genes changed in a way that it just stays on all the time, uh, looks like it's between 10 and 15 percent. Some of the early work suggested it may be as high as 30 percent. Uh, but these observations have actually led to trials using CKIT inhibitors. Uh, Ed talked about ECOG 2607, which looks at dasatinib for mucosal melanomas. We've got a randomized trial that's going to open soon, looks for people who have KIT mutations that are going to randomize to where half the patients get DTIC and half the people get uh, a CKIT inhibitor called uh, nilotinib. We've already seen in the CCOG trial some patients with mucosal melanomas have nice responses. This is a patient at, uh, you can see here, here's a lymph node and here's another lymph node. And uh, it, after six weeks of therapy, these lymph nodes are significantly decreased. So clearly we've had some responses with this and I think other sites have uh, seen similar activity. The Nerlotinib study, which we have that's coming up, uh, is going to be require patients to actually have mutations. The company is going to send for mutation analysis. They promise a five-day turnaround. Uh, since this is not currently standard practice for most centers uh, in terms of doing mutational analysis, um, 
So half the patients will get randomized to decarbazine every three weeks. The other half will get this KIT inhibitor called nilotinib. Uh, the endpoint is progression-free survival, so like how long does it take for the melanoma to start to grow again? Um, and so if you said, well, if I have the mutation, why would I not want to get the, the drug? Um, part of the issue is, is for CKIT melanomas, we don't, you know, nobody's actually ever gone back and looked and said, do CKIT melanomas, do BRAF melanomas, do NRAS melanomas all respond the same to the carbazine or taxol carbo? Uh, which is another taxol, carb, taxol carboplatinum, which is another regimen that we all often use. And so this is a way to address this, but they've got a crossover. So if you progress on decarbazine, then patients get to switch over. So everybody gets a chance of getting the nilotinib. So everybody gets what would be considered the investigational agent. And at the same time, we get to answer, does decarbazine potentially work better in patients with CKIT melanomas? Uh, is, as Pierre pointed out, a number of these trials exclude brain metastasis. This trial also excludes brain metastasis. Um, so those are the, the two trials for tumor-directed therapy I wanted to talk about. So host-directed therapy, this has really kind of been where the action's been for the last decade or so with melanoma. The, uh, Ed briefly mentioned adjuvant therapy, so host, I consider interferon a host-directed therapy, uh, and he talked to you about ECOG 1697. Uh, we've also got a trial open for another vaccine, which is called MAGE-3. Um, this is a vaccine that targets a protein that's expressed in about 70 percent of melanomas. Uh, they're looking at a very select population, people who have to have palpable lymph nodes when they start, they can't have metastatic disease, and they have to be completely resected. So when we talk about adjuvant therapy, what we're talking about is people who've actually had surgery to remove all, visible, all uh, clinically evident disease. And what we're trying to do is get rid of any microscopic disease that's left behind. And so this is a trial looking at patients with palpable nodes that have been removed that randomizes 1,300 patients, so it's a huge trial, being done at multi, not only in multiple centers but multiple countries. This is an international study. Uh, and the vaccine, uh, two-thirds of the patients get vaccine, one-third <coughs> of the patients get placebo. Uh, and the, the basic requirements are you can't have in transit metastasis, which is basically skin involvement outside the nodes, and you have to have a good performance status. Uh, we think, and I think a number of people think this is an interesting agent. The problem, part of the problem with this trial, at least from our standpoint, is, is they're so selective in their patient choices that it's, it's been very hard for us to find these patients. They'll take patients who failed interferon, so if they recur in their nodal basin after interferon, it's, it's an option. Or if you've been radiated in, in a nodal basin, then you could, and you recur in that nodal basin, then you're also eligible. Um, when you start talking about more advanced disease options, uh, the standard for the last 10 years for people who are eligible has really been high dose like interleukin 2. Um, so not really a clinical trial. This is an FDA-approved drug. So high-dose interleukin-2 is, uh, was originally piloted at the NCI as a backbone to give cellular therapy, and it was later found that IL-2 alone had responses. Uh, IL-2 is usually given in, in the hospital. Uh, you, can, you come in for one week, you go home for a week, and then you come back in for a second week, and then about six weeks from when you start, you get your radiographic assessment to see if tumor is bigger or smaller. Um, doses are given every eight hours up to a maximum of 14 doses. The majority of the people do not get the maximum number of doses. The reason the drug's given this way is because it has substantial toxicity. It causes what's called capillary leak, makes your blood vessels leaky, uh, and also can cause some autoimmune phenomena. So you can have inflammation of your liver, you can have uh, fluid build up in your legs or your lungs. And so by us giving the drug every eight hours, if we see that there's a problem, we can hold the next doses because most of the, the side effects are predictable and, re and they resolve uh, within eight to 16 hours. 
So the reason that interleukin-2 was approved was not because it had a response rate of 30 or 40 percent. It actually has a response rate probably in the 10 to 15 percent range. But what was noted was that the people who did respond, uh, some of those people had very durable responses. Uh, so if you look at this top, uh, if I got a point of this, oh, there we go. Oh, I just can't see it on my. So if you look at this top line, this, these are people who had a complete response, meaning that all their tumor disappeared <laughs> with interleukin-2. And if you look at the, this bottom axis, you see number of months since their response before they actually uh, recurred. So some of these patients have what we consider durable long-term responses. Um, and the median survival for this cohort had never been, been reached. Uh, the problem with this is, is interleukin-2 requires great cardiac uh, function. You have to have good pulmonary function. You've got to be able to tolerate some of these toxicities. So even though this is a good therapy for a subset of patients, the, the eligibility requirements to actually receive the therapy exclude a fair number of our patients that we actually see in clinic. And this is just to kind of show you, this, this was actually a patient of mine that I had before we left who, uh, who was a nurse who actually noticed that she had a melanoma that was recurring and kind of photo documented her entire experience uh, and saw that this thing grew rather rapidly and unfortunately the dates are cut off. But this was right before her IL-2 and this is December 3rd, I believe. And then if you look, right before, uh, I think it's the 23rd, I think this was the end of her second week. By that time, she'd had a quite a remarkable response. And then in January of that year, this was almost completely gone. This woman, this is one of these patients who was still in a complete response. She also had some nodes that were involved in her neck. Uh, so for patients who respond, a great therapy. But once again, the problem is not everybody's eligible for it. And, and even the and even the people who do receive the therapy, uh, the majority of people don't get this kind of response. So our experience since we've been here at UH, uh, or since I've been here, we've treated 17 patients in the last year and a half. And, and this brings up something that uh, that's, I can't remember who said this, that they thought maybe melanoma was an old patient, an old person's disease. And I think that's quite far from the truth. I think a lot of you may have family-based experience with this. But if you look at our age range, uh, our age range for IL-2 runs from 20 to 67. Um, so currently in my practice, we've got a number of people under the age of 30 with metastatic melanoma that we're treating. So this is clearly a disease that spares, does not respect age, does not respect sex, and we clearly need better uh, therapies. Our, our response rate has run in the same range as within the studies where we're running at about a 15% response rate. So IL-2 remains the standard of care for selected patients. Uh, there's a currently a trial that's being developed that we're going to participate in that's going to test prospectively some of the biologic markers that we think that we could use to predict who responds to IL-2. So when you've got a therapy that only one in six patients respond to, it would be great if we had a way that up front we could predict who were the patients who had a more likelihood of response, higher likelihood of response. And those studies have been going on for a number of years and it's kind of come into fruition in, this, in the setting of what's called the IL-2 select study where we're going to prospectively look to see if we can pick patients. So the other, uh, host-directed therapy that's really gathered a lot of attention if you've followed, the, followed this in the news lately is CTLA-4 blockade. So as Ed said, CTLA-4 is something that's on T cells. I like to think of it as kind of the breaks to the immune system. So T cells normally require some kind of tumor antigen and then require these other switches on cells to turn them on completely. Uh, it's called B7 and CD28. So when B7 binds with CD28, you get C, uh, T cell activation, but it also induces this other receptor called CTLA-4, and when B7 binds to uh, CTLA-4, uh, you actually get a block in T cell activation. 
So what's happened is a number of drugs have been developed, or a couple of drugs have actually been developed to block this interaction. So basically, the T cell stays on without the breaks being able to be applied. So the drug that was discussed at, at the, our large oncology convention this year called ASCO was a drug called ipilimumab. Uh, and for the rest of the talk, I'll use the word ipi because I also have trouble with, uh, <laughs> with the pronunciation. Uh, so ipi is a drug that is an antibody that blocks this receptor. It's given once every three weeks. In the original trials, it was given once every three weeks for 12 weeks. In this original study, patients were randomized to receive ipi, a vaccine, or both. And a later study looked at patients who responded to IPI, and then they were allowed to receive a second, what was called induction 12 weeks. Uh, what was shown at ASCO this year was for patients who received IPI, so these top two lines, whether or not they got the vaccine, there was an improvement in survival. Uh, the vaccine seemed to function as a placebo. Uh, there have been anecdotal reports of responses to IPI and brain metastasis, and I'm gonna come back to that in a couple of minutes. When you look at the results for IPI, the overall response for both arms that had, that for both groups of patients that, re, that got IPI was 10 months, their survival as opposed to six months. So clearly there was a benefit there. And remarkably, uh, when this was announced, when they said this was the first randomized phase three to ever show a survival benefit in melanoma, the first thing I thought about was my boss's old slide. Uh, and then I realized that decarbazine and IL-2 both were, were not, did not go through a randomized trial. Decarbazine approved years ago, uh, and IL-2 approved because of this durability response, not because compared to decarbazine it was better. It was because some of these people had a, a very good response. So IPI has some, some odd side effects. And so for patients who are thinking about IPI for them or their families, it's worth knowing that these side effects exist. So it causes colitis, which could be manifest as diarrhea. This is basically an immune attack on the colon. Uh, it can cause, cause an autoimmune dermatitis, which manifests as a rash, which is a rash. And it can also cause uh, Hepatitis, which is manifest by liver function abnormalities, which your oncologist would be uh, monitoring. And it can also cause thyroid and hypophysitis, uh, thyroid dysfunction and uh, pituitary dysfunction, which are also things that would be need to be monitored by your physician that you may or may not know that you're having those symptoms consistent with. Uh, because this is an autoimmune induction, or an induction of the immune system attacking not only the melanoma, but sometimes it loses track of what it's fighting and it attacks your body. Uh, you may need steroids to fight off some of these side effects. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about IPI that is not, um, that was not expected is, is because it's a uh, immune mediator, sometimes the immune response is brisk and it actually looks like tumors are progressing. And this was an issue in some of the early trials where patients looked like they were progressing and when they came off therapy, they actually had a late response. And this was a patient that we took care of that had these tumors along the edge of their stomach that then later uh, grew quite rapidly within three weeks of IPI. We actually thought they were infected. Um, but it turns out when we biopsied this, this was actually just tumor full of lymphocytes trying to kill the tumor, and this patient went on to a complete response, and in the setting of this reinduction therapy, went ahead and got reinduced again and stayed in a, in a complete response last time I had heard. So, so clearly there are some people who uh, have these things that look like progression, but also it may actually be a response. And then just briefly to, to, to touch the brain med issue, clearly there were there was a there had been anecdotal reports of people who got IPI who then uh, received um, had responses in the brain after they had come off ipilimumab, which led to a, a a trial of patients with untreated brain metastasis, and this actually showed that 
uh, there were a number of patients that received IPI without any other therapy that actually had responses in the CNS, uh, which is quite unique among immunotherapy. So it's not that the IPI penetrates the brain, it's the immune cells that are stimulated by the IPI that can actually move across the blood vein barrier. So this is something that I think you're going to see a lot more discussion about in the next few years, how this is actually going to work into our practice or practice patterns is going to be difficult to say. Um, so it, like I said, if you like high dose IL-2 has clinical efficacy in a, in a subset of patients, it has a unique side effect profile, which you really need to stay in close contact with your oncologist about. Uh, biomarkers, you know, I keep coming back to this. How do we predict who's going to respond to these drugs? Um, for IPI have remained rather elusive. Um, so currently our, our kind of palette of treatment options for metastatic melanoma at, at UH include high dose interleukin-2, uh, the methoxy Timidar trial, which is a phase one, but the Timidar doses are, are doses that we would normally give melanoma patients, uh, Paxol versus Tefasulam, which is a, uh, another new agent, which I, in the interest of time I didn't talk about, uh, which is, that should be open within the next two weeks. We have ipilimumab available through the expanded access protocol, and when the ECOG trial opens that Ed spoke about, we'll, we will participate in that. Uh, ECOG 2607, which is the desatinib trial, uh, and, and this is directed at patients with CKIT melanomas. Uh, right behind that, we're going to have open this nerlotinib trial for patients, but this requires first-line cytotoxic therapy. And then for our patients we treat with IL-2, we're going to be en enrolling them in the IL-2 select trial. Um, so let's see. So future questions for clinical trials, uh, at least in my mind, are, are, are we going to be able to combine these agents? Some of these agents that, we're, that are, we're hearing a lot about in the press right now look like they have clearly improvements in progression-free survival. Are we going to be able to combine these agents in some ways? where we don't increase toxicity, but we can actually improve response rates and, and how long responses last uh, as we hopefully move toward the idea of, of long-term treatment for melanoma. Like, and, and are there ways to predict responses to these agents where the majority of patients who aren't going to respond can kind of avoid some of the toxicities associated with some of our agents? Because that, you know, from my, from my perspective, if I knew who every person was going to respond, I would not treat anyone else because the toxicity for some of these agents is not mild. As it's been printed out, has been pointed out with interferon, uh, there's toxicities with IL-2. The fact that you've got to be in the hospital and basically ICU level care tells you there's toxicity with that. Ipilimumab. Some people go through it without ever blinking. We've had somebody who's been on the IPI for over two and a half years, and I cannot believe we're actually giving him drug. But at the same time, there are other people who get two or three doses and who wind up in the hospital. So our ability to select collect patients is really kind of the, the, uh, the hope for the next few years in terms of how to select for these new patients, these patients. And so I'll end there. Thanks.